COVID-19 has brought into greater relief the inequities that have been with us for a long time, if not intergenerationally, for many of us. And so when we look at that and think about that, um, this kind of desire that we many of us have, um, myself included, in returning to normal or getting back to normal, um, really causes me uh, to pause and think about, well, are we actually getting back to something that was deeply inequitable? Is that what normal is? Is that the normal that we want? Um, and so I really think about what COVID-19 doing in showing us these inequities is, in fact, an opportunity to think anew about um, our relationships to each other, um, the relationships that we have with schools, um, what kind of work institutions can and should be doing. The murder of George Floyd, uh, for me, similar to COVID-19, has really heightened our awareness rather than being something that was a surprise. Our questions and challenges around racial justice have been from the onset of this particular country and globally um, we're talking about centuries. For me the murder of George Floyd really brought on the notion or created visibility around this long-standing practice of abolition that in many ways began with uh, the desire to end uh, enslavement um, here in the United States and globally um, but really thinking then about how the forces that created and produced slavery have continued to persist in different ways over these last 500 years, give or take. So when we're looking at learning, teaching, education, what I'm thinking about is profound change, systemic changes, things that change um, in a sustainable way. Um, and I think that's where we're we really have a lot more work to do. Um, and I hope that for my own work, um, really, and inviting others to continue to, uh, to think and act in ways that um, look at it systematically rather than um, as these kind of one-off initiatives. Um, there's a danger, I think, when we look at things in a kind of uh, what I might think of, what we might think about as bracketing um, racial justice initiatives as something separate. Um, I think interest will wane. Um, our commitments to it, funding streams will dry up. Um, and so things like, you know, good racial justice initiatives may wither on the vine. Um, so I think of two examples in particular where um, we're seeing some, some of the gains, I think, um, around um, both COVID-19 um, from a social educational perspective as well as racial justice. Uh, one of them is very local. Um, uh, one of the schools that I partner with here in the city of Philadelphia Kensington Health Sciences Academy, um, which is a community neighborhood high school in the Kensington sector of Philadelphia. And they had been, you know, for several years now, had been doing a lot of work around cultivating um, what they describe as a kind of critically conscious community, whether it be through their classrooms and instruction, outreach, community building activities, uh, partnering with parents, families, as well as a number of community-based organizations. What we see there and what had been there prior to the pandemic was um, something to, to cherish, um, a, a very precious kind of community. Um, and I felt privileged to be uh, connected to that community in some small way. Um, and it's been uh, fascinating to see what they have tried to do in the context of COVID-19 and racial injustice, um, as, as, been marked, as has been marked by uh, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, the work that they do is really focused on um, uh, using social media to engage, um, having, uh, you know, outdoor activities, um, focusing on mutual aid, whether it be uh, gathering food and supplies for their families and communities um, and the surrounding neighborhood, or, um, you know, hosting um, online uh, kind of pep rallies um, for the school community um, to honor students and the efforts of students, um, as well as teachers. The other important piece um, that I've been thinking about uh, as an example is on the state level, and that's the fight for fair funding in the state of Pennsylvania. The state of Pennsylvania is ranked 45th in state funding for public education. Uh, the fair funding trial, um, which began in November of 2021, has actually began in 2014. So the fight for fair funding has been one that is ongoing and the uh, Education Law Center and some of the other 
advocates, um, litigators, a litigation team that has uh, been fighting this fight alongside different community organizations and activist groups and school districts and families and parents and students across the state of Pennsylvania who have been fighting have been at this for, for quite some time. And I think what's powerful about that is, um, or, or what we need to note is that um, what they're asking for is the state, for the state to just fund the schools adequately, appropriately. It's not even asking for extra. It's asking the state um, to meet uh, a metric of adequacy that currently they're short by $4.6 billion, um, which is a huge sum. And I'm excited about the possibility of a victory or a positive outcome uh, from this trial, something that would be historic and transformative for the students and families that make up the 500 school districts of Pennsylvania. But that the ultimate goal should be one of providing high quality, um, nurturing, safe education for every single student in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and so I think we should all be uh, engaged and participating and thinking about how we can create within whatever context we're in um, that kind of feeling of safety and protection um, that's sustainable uh, and worthwhile and collective I think in um, uh, in the kinds of efforts um, that we we all want I think for for kids for students for families um, and I think that fight is, is worth continuing to fight um, in the years to come.